progress. Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we open the word of God today, shall we seek his guidance and his blessing? Shall we look to understand these things in the light of events that are currently happening and seek to define the symbols that we see from that which is being presented before us? Shall we pray? Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that this has been passed down to us for this time in Earth's history. We ask, Father, for your guidance and your blessing as we join together. We thank you that you would join with us so that as we open your word, we may come into a clearer understanding of that which you would have us to know at this time in Earth's history. Direct us now, be with us. I thank you for each one that are attending this meeting and those that may <clears throat> view this later via the internet. Thank you for these blessings, for your guidance and for your loving kindness. For this, we thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we were at the last verse of Judges yesterday as we we're going through this. Before we go on into the next chapter, and after him was Shamgar the son of Anath, who slew of the Philistines 600 men with an ox goad, and he also delivered Israel. So after him is referring to Ahud, correct? Um, Ehud? Um, yeah, well, yeah, except that it, as we looked at the Hebrew word, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's after. Right. Okay. So, so they translate the word after, and it can mean quite a few different things. Okay. Uh, um, so, but is this okay? So it's the the word after is translated in several different ways. But is this giving reference to Ehud? Ehud. Yep. Ehud. Yep. <clears throat> him. So yeah, after him, I I would assume that's the best way to translate it. Okay. Any ideas to what Shamgar means? Did we address this? <clears throat> yes, we did. So uh, Shamgar means a sword. Okay. And Anath is answer. And I was just looking at, yeah, so um, in the form that this word here after and, and after him, um, so this is, um, so basically one way you could translate this is um, very loosely is, um, it's sort of it's sort of like um, the, they use this quite a bit to just introduce a story, and so it was. Is one way of 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 translating it, and so it was that Shamgar, but it's it it's being used as a preposition here, right? Um, so it, it often means to delay or tarry or defer or hesitate, remain behind, and um, uh, or following. So usually it's it's used often in a sense in a story. You're telling a story, 
and then you're just introducing something else. You're not necessarily saying that it occurred afterwards. Um, so I, I, my position is that it's occurring at that time, during the time of Ehud, that it's just being mentioned about something that was happening in the western part of, of, of Israel, or this other stories in the eastern part. Okay. Now, is there any, any relevance for us that we can see that Shamgar had slain 600 Philistines? Especially slaying 600 Philistines with, with, with what amounts to being a pointed stick. Yeah. yeah. And he also delivered Israel. Right. So there's something that's going on with Othniel, and then Ehud, right? So we have these first two. And now we have this, this idea that there's this other thing that's been happening. And so when we had put these things, we had placed them into our lines, um, specifically with Ehud, the introduction of the 2520 and the charts. And then it brings us up all the way to the point of, of Ezra 7, 9 is where, where we're sort of placing that it with this key. And of course that key is going to carry on, but it's, it, so it's introducing us to the point where Ezra 7, 9 comes into play and then really to the end, but it's really up to the point of Ezra 7, 9. So it's giving us that history from uh, 2005 uh, to 2000. And, and 12 is kind of uh, the point, 2012 <clears throat> to 2013, seven, a period of seven to eight years. Okay, so question that I have to ask. If we place Othniel as being a message of repentance. Yeah, which would start at 9-11. Okay. Yeah. Would we then look, or could we then look at Ehud and Shamgar as being the opening and then the closing of the message of giving glory to God, the second angel's message? Um, okay, well, as far as... I see all of this as the second angel's message, this whole history of the judges. So, so I mean, I wouldn't disagree with that, but uh, I think that the significance here is that you have this 2520 message and the charts, and then it mentions almost in passing Shamgar. So this is some other kind of message it's not necessarily connected with the main message in this movement. Or maybe it just has part of the elements of it. Yeah, part of the elements of it. So. I mean, <clears throat> we recognize the fact that without the first and second angel's message, you cannot have a third. Yeah. Now, we recognize also that by 1844, the first and the second angel's message had arrived, they'd been formalized, and they had been empowered. Yet, on the arrival of the third angel's message, it was not formalized and was not empowered. And to this day, the third angel's message has not truly been formalized <clears throat> or empowered. Mm -hmm. So we have a repeat of the first and second angel's message because that's why Future for America was raised up. Yeah. So at our time right now, we again have 
elements of the first and second angel's message that the Millerites had given, but we need to truly recognize this so that this becomes empowered for our time. And part of that empowerment was July 18th. Yeah. So would you try to attach this to Shamgar then? I'm, I'm asking if it's possible. Well, well I, I think it's definitely possible because because I think it actually relates to because so the idea of the ox goat. So um, as we said, the ox comes from the word for plowing. And the idea is then of making these rows when you plow. Right. Line upon line. And, and the word go, this is the only time that this word actually exists. Uh, Malmud um, in this sort of uh, spelling um, in, in the Bible. But it actually comes from uh, the word lamad, which means to teach or instruct. And so, so it is definitely a pointed stick, but it's used for instruction or teaching as a symbol. So when you look at the word that it comes from, lamad, that occurs 85 time in, times in the Bible. 32 times it's teach, 17 times learned, 17 times taught, five times learned, five times teacheth, two instructed, one expert, uh, one instruct, and one skillful, one teachers, one teaches, one teaching. And also it's translated as unaccustomed, um, but that's because it's put together with another word, unaccustomed to the yoke, referring to uh, an animal. Anyway. So, um, so definitely here we we could we can see this as the applications of the lines as we have now understood them. So it's something that comes into the message, which I believe is connected to this key of Ezra seven nine. But it's then going to be opened up, and that's what Shamgar would represent. But this 600 Philistines, we noted that it's double the number of, of, of um, the Gideon's 300. Right. But there must be something else to this. I don't know what that 600 would be. But does this also have something to do with their manner, their manner of demise? Well, yeah. Now, the interesting thing about the number six, um, it, it, it's it's six as an overplus. That is, it's one beyond the five fingers of the hand. Okay. That's that's what the number six is kind of, uh, which I think is a strange way of looking at it. But that's that's what Strong says. Whether, whether that is something that comes from the Hebrew or not, I haven't been able to figure out. Um, but that's, of course, 600, but you know, not to just the number six. But that's what the number six means. It says a primitive number, six, and over plus. And it says C7797. So I have to look that up. So something here, I guess the idea is that this has to do with counting. If that makes okay. sense. Which, which would have to do with um, what this, this message that we're doing right now. I mean, when I first started doing this chronology stuff, I used to count out dates on my fingers. So... It comes from the word, that doesn't make sense. Did I read that right? C7797, which means joy or to exalt. Hmm. <clears throat> Not sure how that, that goes. That goes right back to the point that I was making earlier. Yeah. Because 
if this is interrelated with the second angel's message, are we not to give glory to God for the victories that are happening in our lives and that we're seeing within this message? Mm -hmm. I mean, Shamgar, the sword, dispatches the Philistines with an ox goat, not with a sword. Right. Because how many, how many Philistines do you think would have been afraid of an ox goad when they had the swords and Israel didn't? I don't think they would be. And, and his name Shamgar, which means a sword, but he's the son of the answer. So right. he, he's, in a sense, answering the sword with an ox goat. Seems like it's saying, too, that God will use ways and means we would never expect. Right. I would agree. Yeah. Which is why I think, you know, part of the thing dealing with, with all these lines and these these diagrams that Stephen and I have drawn. This wasn't originally, when we drew lines, they didn't have this, all these time elements and dates and everything on them, right? I mean, we'd have an event like 9-11, the Sunday law or so forth. But these lines have developed into something that's an extremely good analytical tool, which is why, you know, this idea of this ox goat as being teaching um, instruction um, and ex a, a instruction with these lines. So, so I would think this has something to do with the message of this chronology that comes out of the understanding that this message had already established. Okay. Okay, comment from the chat. I wonder whether number numbers five about the challenge and the guilt finding or exculpation of a woman accused of adultery could be connected to Eglon's evisceration. It relates to Revelation 10, eight through 11. The dangerous drink given by a priest, the graven images, quarries, I thought of Isaiah 13, 19 through 21. And this is about ancient Babylon, literally. It symbolizes the des desolation and destruction of spiritual Babylon. And since earthly Babylon is in Iraq and 319, could be 391 and have a reference to Islam and Josiah Litt's prophecy. Okay, but how does that interrelate with what we're dealing with here with Shamgar? No, I mean, it's just something like I wanted to send, send it out last night, but didn't get around to it. So I thought I'd do it now. Okay. It, sorry, I have to... But no. maybe it was the wrong time. If I don't do it now, it'll be lost. So if it has any value, have at it. And also regarding the, uh, the ox goat, I was thinking of Paul when the Lord said to him, it is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. So people are trying to evade the conviction of God. They're not going to escape. Like they'll, they'll be dealt with whether they want it or not, or whether they recognize it or not. Well, one of the, one of the points that I'm, I'm considering on this, as far as the ox code, is we have to accept that when you're going to goad an ox, when you're going to try to instruct an ox in the way that you wish it to go, that the hide of an ox is fairly thick. 
So it takes something that is substantial at that time to be able to provide the instruction that is necessary. Now, an ox code is going to be a lot different when it's used upon a person than it is on an ox. So there's still quite a bit. Some people are very, sorry, Dwight. Oh, Some people are very stubborn and self-willed and they need a spiritual ox code. I frequently needed it. Okay. <clears throat> There's quite a bit within this verse. Yeah, the other thing is the word 100 or 100. Okay. It's um, also as multi, multi, multipli, multiplicative. Multiplicative? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> and a fraction. So it, it refers to the multiplying and also to making fractions. So if we put this together with the six, which is an overplus of the hand, to lift up the hand in praise or joy, and then this idea of multiplication and fractions, um, and that we have these lines and this instruction, I mean, that definitely would refer to um, the message that, um, that I'm a part of in dealing with these dates and numbers and spans of time and their symbolic representation and all the math associated with that. Okay. Now, the ox goad, mm -hmm. in, in this with the translators, we're given this reference from 1 Samuel 17, 47 and verse 50. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with the sword and the spear, for the battle is the Lord's, he will give you into our hands. So David prevailed over the Philistines with a sling and a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. And there was no sword in the hand of David. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so we can see that God is using, I mean, when, okay. If you look at part of what, um, the first presentation I did, October 5th, uh, 2012, that I did in this movement was um, uh, some morning morning meetings at our weekend uh, convocation or whatever you want to call it that we had near, near Edmonton. And what I had shown there was that line upon line doesn't refer to a line of scripture, even though we've always used it that way as Seventh-day Adventists that the line is a measuring line and a precept means to set an order up upon a line, right? Precept upon precept, line upon line, from here to here or to points of time. So not just events, but, but the idea of here can relate to, uh, to time, not just to place. So, so when we look at how we as Seventh-day Adventists have always done it. We've used, and I'm not saying we don't use the Bible, the sword, but God has given us a means to look and analyze events in history and prophecy that isn't just directly that the Bible says this, that we, we take the events and, and the symbols that are given in the Bible, and then we can construct these lines, and these then instruct us. So some, and that's why some people oppose the message because they want to have a plain statement. Um, it's like I was uh, having this discussion with this guy who had had this debate back in 2017 and, and um, still commenting on this video occasionally. But, you know, he says there's no place in the Bible where it says that every time we have a, a, uh, 
a, a number like you know 1335 or 1260 that it says we have to apply day for a year we only have the two places where it says to apply a day for a year and that we need to have a verse every time telling us to apply a day for a year which of course is ridiculous but for some people they want to have the bible just tell you stuff and if it doesn't tell you in plain english they don't want to interpret it that is you know the, what we're doing with the lines with the 2520 um you know, they say, well, there's no prophecy that that starts the 2520. Well, there is, but it's not clear enough for them. They want it spelled out. And, and I think this is kind of what this is talking about, not using a sword, right? Um, but he's going to use, you know, David's going to use a stone and a sling. And... You know, this just just doesn't fit with some people's idea of how God is going to do things. Now, the stone is also used in the sense of a plummet as well, or as a weight. So remember, in um, uh, in uh, what's Isaiah twenty-eight. Isaiah, Isaiah 28, yeah, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, so in Isaiah 28, you have judgment also will I lay to the line and righteousness to the plummet. Now, of course, here the word plummet is a different word, but, but still the idea applies um, that God uses these different methods to, to actually instruct us and to conquer our enemies. And, of course, there we also have the Philistine in, in connection with with David here and um, and then the sling um, is is often also seen as a door or a screen uh, or the valve of the door itself that is the hinge or the hanging so so this could refer to a chiasm Right, so so a door has a sling, what we call a hinge. Is that so, yeah? So if it has a hinge, yeah, then it's dependent upon something to be able to swing. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, what else can we see from this? Well, if it's something that can swing, then that reminds me of the scales, the uh, balances, which again is measurement, right? Yeah, balances. Well, balances are a chiasm, okay. which, which we know already. Now, I find it interesting that in, in looking these things over, that the translators also noted that this example with Shamgar applied only to the country that was next to the Philistines. So we have issues that are occurring in the east and the west and very likely in the north and the south. So we have an apostasy that is being shown as being well nigh universal within Israel. Yeah, and we have different messages from different quarters. So right. Speak, um, that God is using in this period of the judges because Israel is not united. Right. In the period of the judges. It, and, and so that's why you can't just add up the... Uh, the years of the judges to get the period of the judges because there, there's an overlap happening here. Okay. Now, looking at Judges 4.
Israel is oppressed by Jabin and Sisera. Deborah stirreth up Barak to their deliverance. Deborah and Barak go up with an army to Mount Tabor. Sisera is defeated. He, flew it, he fleeth to the tent of Jael, who killeth him. Jabin is totally subdued. Now, here again, we have this conjunction. And the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord when Ahud was dead. Is this the same word that we were just addressing as being a conjunction in the beginning of the story of Shamgar? Um, which word are you looking for? Which part? I was... When we're looking at Judges 4, verse 1, the first word, and? Yeah, so that, well, this is, a, this is just the Vav, so it's a different word. Okay. Yeah, but but we, yeah, so this just means uh, when they put this in a, um, when they say and, I mean, and, and I'm just even seeing what they have here. Um, actually, this is interesting. Okay. Okay. So, so normally when you just see the word and, and so it was, sometimes they just put a vav, that, that means it's just a, a sort of a continuation. Uh, here, though, we have the word Yasef. That's the first word. And um, so, so the order of the sentence is a little bit different than you would normally have. Um, now, Yasef means to add or augment, right? That is, uh, it can be translated as prolong, all kinds of different things, further. But that's where it's going to start. Now, that word then um, because what it says literally is is again or to add uh, the children of Israel uh, uh, to uh, what's the word here um, so well, that doesn't really make any sense so they so they did or they made evil bad raha um in the sight of the lord so that word again is the word that comes from the word yasef and that's in leviticus 26 where it says i will uh you know you punish me seven times more for your sins and that's the word yasef or joseph right so here they just put this in the sort of in the middle of the sentence but it's actually the first word in the hebrew in so so again, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. They could have put it that way instead of putting and the children of Israel again. So I'm not sure why they chose to put it in that order, but that's the way I would have done it is again, the children of Israel uh, did evil in the sight of the Lord. Okay. What else do we see in this verse? Well, Ehud is dead. Okay, so my, my question comes back to this. When we are looking in this particular section, chapters three and chapter four, mm -hmm. Ehud is raised up after the death of Joshua and those elders that served with Joshua. Yeah. And this is a message, of course. It's symbolizing a message. Okay. The apostasy occurs and is being recorded here after the death of Ehud. Mm-hmm. Why is it being recalled after the death of Ehud and not Shamgar? Well, my view is that Shamgar is actually just occurring during the time of Ehud. I agree. But this is why 
I was making the application with the second angel's message, both of the Millerite time and now of our time. Uh So again, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord when Ahud was dead. Uh And the Lord said, sold them unto the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, that reigned in Hazor, the captain of whose host was Sisera, who dwelt in Harasheth of the Gentiles. I mean, it's, it's kind of tempting to list these as people in the, in, in the movement. Because um, I already see some things here, but... Um, so, so remember, these are the enemies, or these are the messages, or the false messages that the God is allowed to continue in the movement because we didn't put an end of them. And, and one of the things that I found sort of surprising was Parminder, because Parminder, he had made this time prediction, and basically. Uh, Jeff said in 2012 that what Parminder was doing was fanaticism. But Parminder managed to not be defeated, or his message was not defeated, and that message came back into the movement, the message of time setting. Now, as I've said many times, I don't believe in time setting. That is, even when Parminder um, was doing his time setting and Jeff had supported it, Jeff had supported it in sort of with a lot of caveats. And I even had more. That is, in my view, um, I recognized that time existed in the movement, but that we couldn't present, we couldn't, I was having trouble with predicting any of those events that Ellen White had warned us against predicting. And that's because I didn't buy into the dispensational argument that that only applied for Ellen White's day and doesn't apply for our day. Because Ellen White's the prophet to the end of time. Everything she says still stands. And so I, I saw that as, as basically destroying the spirit of prophecy as, as relevant. And then we saw that how that his argument for time setting, how it then basically undid the entire message of Adventism so that we have Parminder and his group where they are today. So if, the, if that is a, an enemy that wasn't killed, that God allowed to prove or test us, well, that definitely would be this example that we're gonna see here in this story. Um, and, and you know maybe and maybe what we see here in judges is sometimes the same story repeated over and over but just with different elements and i think that's kind of the position i take with with the judges it refers to this movement from 2001 till the end wherever that is which is typical of what's going to happen and um so you know when you're dealing with uh Cicera and I mean, I have a hard time not seeing this as connected to Parminder. Okay. So, so this, yeah. When when we're looking at this, it it is intriguing when we're when we're looking because comparing this verse by verse, Jabin, the king of Canaan, that reigned in Hazor. Mm-hmm. was given reference in Joshua chapter 11. And it came to pass when Jabin, king of Hazor, had heard these things, those things, that he sent Jobab, the king of Madon, and to the king of Shemron, and to the king of Akshaph. So we have a, a three-in-one combination here. We have a a group that is being unified against Israel shown in Judges, Confederacy. Mm -hmm. 
And Joshua at that time turned back and took Hazor and smote the king thereof with the sword, for Hazor before time was the head of all those kingdoms. Mm -hmm. So this king, Hazor, that, no, excuse me, Jabin, that reigned in Hazor, calls for confederacy. And there's three other groups that join with him. Now, have we not seen that there have been four groups that had been within the movement that then and since have opposed many of the messages that Elder Jeff had presented? Yeah. And, and and now we have when Ehud was dead. So again, you know, this death of Ehud, I in in this context would again represent Jeff. Right. So that's that's you know, I mean that's kind of where I'm seeing Parminder in 2019. Um, so that's why I say it repeats some of the same history of the different lines that we see in the judges. But you know, maybe I'm jumping the gun here in, in applying it that way, but so what is the meaning of Jabin? Well, it means uh, intelligent. Now, it comes from this, um, the word bien, which means to separate mentally or distinguish, that is generally understand, attend, consider, be cunning, diligent, direct, discern, eloquent, feel, inform, instruct, have intelligence, know, look well to, mark, perceive, be prudent, regard, skill, teach, think. Uh, cause, make, to get, give, have, understanding, and um, et cetera. So now, now that's Strong's. Now, Brown Driver Briggs um, says it really has to do with observation. It's because the word Jabin means whom God observes. But of course, they put its, its um, uh, root as being the same one, 995. In, in Hebrew, and that word, according to to Brown Drivers Briggs, just got to look at their definition, is again to perceive or understand, to observe, mark, discernment, um, instruct. So one of the things we can see with Parminder is he's instructing, but he's doing it in the ways of Canaan, right? And, and very secretly, deceptively. Right, so he's using more a type of philosophy in his teaching. So is this situation with Jabin similar or equivalent to one that is saying that the writings of Ellen White and the warnings of Ellen White were okay for her time, but they that they can be safely set aside today. Mm -hmm. So in continuing with this, we could apply this as being part of a false message. Yeah, so, so this is a, a, a false message, yeah. Now, Cicera. 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 Yeah. I, 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 just the way you pronounce that, it makes me think of Cicero, but I don't see Cicero with this. Yeah, it's Cicera. It's just they put the accent on the first and the last syllable. Okay. What does this name mean? Well, it means battle array. Um, is one is Brown Drivers Briggs. Um, it doesn't really. It says in Strong's it's of uncertain derivation. So, and and they do say it's of uncertain der derivation in Brown Drivers Briggs as well. But they say it means battle array.
So are we are we saying Sisera is armor? Um, well, yeah, that would be the idea. I guess battle array would be the things that you're arrayed with to battle. Um, well, well, would it be armor or would it be a banner? Doesn't really say. Now, what about Hazor? Well, well, Hazor is it means a village. Um, there's two places in Palestine and one in Arabia named Hazor. So it's just a village. So if that's a village, what's Harosheth? Um, Harosheth is um, uh, woodland. It's a city in the north of the land of Canaan on the west coast of the Lake Merom. Which I, I think we've looked at before. So I, would, I would think we have looked at it before because we looked yeah. at Hazor before. Yeah, yeah. So we looked at it before. But I remember looking at it on the map is what I'm saying. <laughs> okay. Right. Now, it, it, it comes from a, a work which means a carving or cutting. Um, oddly, which seems weird. Uh, even though it means woodland, I guess maybe a place where it's carved into the, the woods. So that means it's surrounded by woods or something, but that's where it comes from. So just the word 2799, Okay, so Hazor was, was given as part of the territory for Naphtali. Yeah, I wouldn't put it as cutting a covenant, but maybe. Uh, this is more mechanical work. Something done, not so much uh, cutting a covenant, but anyway. That was just a comment in the chat there. Right, I see that. Uh, yeah, I don't think I would put it with cutting a covenant. That's quite different. That that has a very different kind of con connotation. Yeah. Now, and now, when they call it Heroshet of the Gentiles, right, the Goyim, um, so that's to distinguish it from some other place, I would think, or or maybe it's just that, um, you know, it's just kind of weird that they put that in there, of the Gentiles. Is this something that we are being directed to pay attention with? Yeah, I mean, well, well, it is interesting. It's, it says here in Strong's. So when it comes to the word Gentiles or Goyim, um, apparently from the same root as one, four, six, five, in the sense of massing a foreign nation, hence a Gentile, also figuratively a troop of animals or a flight of locusts. Gentile, heathen, nation, people. So, and that's the way that the Jews thought of the nations as sort of these massings of armies that come against them, which symbolically, of course, could be understood as locusts. So, so there are some symbols here that are interesting. So, so it's interesting here. So you have Sisera, which dwelt in Harosheth of the Gentiles. So uh, he's the captain of the host. Right. And you have, you have, so he's the general, right? You have Jabin, who's the king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. But he's going to have this, this general Sisera, who dwells in Harosheth of the Gentiles. 
So, so you have these two characters here symbolizing something. The question is, what are we seeing as a symbol here? I don't know. Maybe we need to, to get a bit more information. Okay. So in this section, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, for he had 900 chariots of iron, and 20 years he mightily oppressed the children of Israel. So for 20 years, Jabin oppresses the children of Israel. And here we have 900 chariots of iron being mentioned. Now, in the time of Nebuchadnezzar, we know that Nebuchadnezzar is given a vision where this great tree winds up being cut down and you have, I believe it's a, a band, is it a band of iron and brass? Yeah. That's, that's applied to it? Yeah. So here we have iron, but not brass. Why? What's being said about the condition of the children of Israel when iron itself is applied and not brass? Well, iron usually refers to oppression, brass usually to drought or famine, I mean, just in a simple sense. Um, but they they have they sort of are usually connected. Um, okay, I don't know. Okay. Now, I'm looking, at, as you said, we need more information about this. Mm -hmm. So, Signs of the Times, 16th of June, 1881. Mrs. White gives us an example. In the northern part of the land of Canaan, near Lake Maram, lay the possessions of Jabin, the king of Hazor, and one of the most powerful and formidable of the enemies of Israel. In the days of Joshua, this monarch united with other kings against Israel, but was utterly defeated and his city was burned. After some years, however, the Canaanites recovered from their defeat and rebuilt the city. A new king, Jabin, reigning like his predecessor in Hazor, rose into great power. The commander of his armies, Sisera, was an able and successful general. His forces were well-equipped and powerful, including 900 chariots of iron. The Israelites 
having again separated themselves from God by idolatry, were grievously oppressed by their enemies. The property and even the lives of the people were in constant danger. Hence, the villages and lonely dwellings were deserted and the people congregated in the walled cities. The high roads were unoccupied and the people went from place to place by unfrequented byways. At the places for drawing water, many were robbed and even murdered, and to add to their distress, the Israelites were unarmed. Among 40,000 men, not a spear or sword could be found. For 20 years, the Israelites groaned under the yoke of the oppressor. Then they turned from their idolatry and with humiliation and repentance, cried unto the Lord for deliverance. They did not cry in vain. There was dwelling in Israel a woman illustrious for her piety, and through her the Lord chose to deliver his people. Her name was Deborah. She was known as a prophetess, and in the absence of the usual magistrates, the people had sought to her for counsel and justice. The Lord communicated to Deborah his purpose to destroy the enemies of Israel and bade her send for a man named Barak of the tribe of Naphtali and make known to him the instructions which she had received. She accordingly sent for Barak and directed him to assemble 10,000 men of the tribes of Naphtali and Zebulun and make war upon the armies of King Jabin. So Jabin was a title, not a person. Right? Um. Because you have the Jabin of Joshua, and now you have Jabin during the time of Deborah and Barak. Well, it's possible. I mean, it could be just two different people with the same name, but. Now, if it was two different people with the same name, would, I mean, and, and I'm agreed that it is, but if it was, if it would that, I mean, it could imply a familiar relationship, it could also imply that the name Jabin is the title. Yeah. Yeah, it's possible. I'm just saying, you know, it could be like the house of Jabin, sometimes the title. Uh, and this is, um, you know, the, for instance, Often the enemies of Israel would refer to the king of Judah as David, um, even if it's not David, or um, Omri, even if it's not Omri, just because they're referring to the dynasty. Right. Right. So, um, so it could be something like that, but, but anyway, it's. It's definitely not the same person, I don't think, right? Because that would imply a fairly long way person. Yeah. So in keeping with what we've been doing, now we have Deborah entering the scene. And she was the wife of Lapidoth or Lapidoth, however, you, however that's to be pronounced. Lapidoth, La Lapidoth, yeah. So what is Lapidoth? Um, well, it, um, it means a flame. Okay. And then the doth is just the feminine, the feminine form of that. Right, which which is kind of odd uh, that 
because if she's the wife of Lath Lapidoth, um, if her husband's name is Lapidoth, he has a female name. But and what is Deborah? Uh, well, that's a B, if I remember correctly, isn't it? I, I'm just going through memory. Yeah, a B. Um, so um, now it could be instead of wife of Lapidoth, but I mean, not saying that it, but it could be that she's the woman of Lapidoth or the woman of the flame. Okay. Because it can be, it can be translated as woman. So it may not be referring to her husband, especially since it has the feminine form, Lapidoth. But if we if we look at this as the woman of the flame, is she then not being imbued with the Holy Spirit? Yeah. So I find it interesting in continuing through this, this document, for Signs of the Times, 16th of June, 1881. Barak knew the scattered, disheartened, and unarmed condition of the Hebrews and the strength and the skill of their enemies. Although he had been designated by the Lord himself as the one chosen to deliver Israel, and had received the insurance that God would go with him and subdue their enemies. Yet he was timid and distrustful. He accepted the message from Deborah, from the bee, as the word of God. But he had little confidence in Israel and feared that they would not obey his call. He refused to engage in such a doubtful undertaking unless Deborah would accompany him and thus support his efforts by her influence and counsel. Deborah consented, but assured him that because of his lack of faith, the victory gained should not bring honor to him, for Sisera would be betrayed into the hands of a woman. What does Barak mean? I'm sure it means lightning. Yeah, that's what I have. So in other words, here is timid lightning. That's a really oxy oxymoronic kind of a uh, situation, isn't it? But the man is so timid, he is so scared that Israel is not going to walk by faith, that he appeals to the woman, to the bee, that she go with him. And prophetically, she states that the glory on this will not be his, but that Sisera would be defeated by a woman. Well, perhaps Barak wasn't so, so timid as wise and discreet in knowing that he could have her counsel. And he was assured by her counsel. He didn't want to make make an error and he knew what Israel was like like so vacillating and so uh, unfaithful when they weren't being held in check by a wise ruler but what what was Mrs. White saying Barack was assured by God that he was being called for this yet Barack 
could not take the word of God, he had to appeal to a woman, a church, to assist him to gain the victory. Well, yeah, Ellen White says he was timid and distrustful. Hey, sorry, my mind must have wandered again. And refused to engage in such a doubtful undertaking unless Deborah would accompany him and thus support his efforts by her influence and counsel. Deborah consented but assured him that because of his lack of faith, the victory gained should not bring honor to him, for Cicero would be betrayed into the hands of a woman. So, I mean, he's definitely timid and distrustful. Um, he had little confidence in Israel, so part of his distrust was in, in Israel itself and feared that they would not obey his call. So he refused to engage in such a doubtful undertaking. So, so there's something going on here that we need to understand, of course. Well, as, as we have talked the last couple of Sabbaths, we cannot afford to trust in ourselves. Yeah. Our situation is we need to recognize our weakness what Barak is recognizing is the weakness of Israel, but he's not recognizing his own weakness in setting aside the word of God to appeal to the word of Deborah. Now, isn't this what we saw occurring in 1888? Now, can we make an application for today within the movement? Well, so when I look at this, so this is just me, you know, thinking. When I look at this, this would, if, if I was going to represent a person, I would represent myself as Barack. Okay. So I would say I'm timid and distrustful. So when, when Parminder brought in his message... I wasn't very bold in opposing him, which which I should have. So I, I just look at my character defect here. But were you appealing to the church for support in the situation with Parmenter? Well, yes. So not the not the because Israel here is not going to be the church. If if we're applying this to our movement, this is internal within the movement. And yeah, that's that's what I was appealing to. Well, uh, how? Well, by by leaving everything in in the hands of the movement. So when I was opposed re regarding July eighteenth and all those things. I basically was quiet. I didn't do anything other than study. So, but you know, I, I'm just I'm just thinking on my feet here. As far as when I see something about myself, um, I had little confidence in Israel or little confidence in in the movement to do this. So, so Deborah here, I don't know what Deborah would represent. I'm just saying, I see a defect in my own character as far as um, not opposing, not doing what, what I probably knew to be the right thing in, in opposing, because I'm just looking at this as being the message of Parminder. That's the way that I'm looking at it. So... But I'm not saying that we can apply just individuals here, but I'm just saying for me personally, that's what I see my weakness as, that that sort of timidness of not, not standing strong against something. And so the placement that we're addressing would be that the messages of Parminder and Tess were in a manner of speaking similar to the oppression of Jabin the second Jabin. 
Mm-hmm. Then who would have been the first? Well, I don't know if you have to apply who would be the first because these are just they could even be representing the same the same history. I don't know. Um, I mean, Parminder could be representing himself. The first could be Parminder in 2012 and then Parminder in 2019 because he wasn't dealt with completely. Jeff allowed him back into the movement. Okay. And, I, and we don't, I mean, I don't personally know why that even happened. What was going on behind the scenes um, that Parminder ended up taking the place and position that he did based upon his past history. All right. And she dwelt under the palm tree of Deborah between Rama and Bethel in Mount Ephraim. And the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. Rama became the home of Samuel. Bethel is the house of God. Yet she dwelt under a palm tree. She's not dwelling in the city of palm trees, which we've identified as Jericho, yeah. but she is still dwelling under the palm tree. So that symbol is still there. Right. And we're giving a placement between Rama and Bethel. Why is that important for us? What is there between Rama and Bethel? I mean, I don't remember the, the definition of Rama, but Bethel is definitely the house of God. Uh, okay. Well, Rama is um, so so. You got between Rama, Rama and Bethel. You have Mitzpah. And what's important about Mitzpah? Well, it means judgment, or is this a judgment? Or I always get that word mixed up. Don't the children of Israel often repair back to Mitzvah? Watchtower. It's the watchtower. That's what it is. Right. Right. Yeah. So they, yeah. So it's some place they go back to. Yep. Yeah. So she, t so she lives basically in Mitzvah or around Mitzvah because it's the only place between Rama and Bethel. So we have a watchtower that also has a palm tree. Mm -hmm. Is this a combination of two symbols or is this a comparison of two symbols? It's a combination of two symbols. So, so I would think that, you know, because this is really about messages. I mean, you know, to, you know, I'm not saying that I'm Barack. Uh, I'm just saying that there is this, at least to the message that I had, in in addressing Parminder, it was timid, right? That is, nothing that that I was presenting was really attacking what Parminder was teaching directly. Indirectly, it was um, because if you if you go back to the uh, to the camp meeting in 2018 at the School of the Prophets, I did a presentation dealing with um, uh, the week of Christ. And in that, I was addressing the close of probation that was being taught by people already um, regarding November 9th. Now, I oppose that 
but I don't think people even caught on that I was opposing it. I think the only person that I know that sort of understood I was opposing it was Tabo. And so, so you know, maybe my my being indirect allowed you know Parminder's message to go on. But when it comes to this this woman, the B, this is a message. Right, so we're not looking to some person to be represented by Barack or Deborah. Um, there is this message that is a timid message that is to deliver God's people, but it's going to be the message that's represented by the B that's going to be the death blow to Parminder or to his message. And that and that's going to be what Jeff presents after uh, September seventh, twenty nineteen. I don't know if people are following my logic or not. Well. This would be then be placing that Elder Jeff and the movement were in apostasy and allowing Parminder to hold sway. Yeah, when Jeff admits that, that, that he was wrong in passing the, the cloak to Parminder. It, it, I mean, the par parallel is Baal Peor as well, and Moses in being negligent in observing what was happening. All right. So, so Jeff admitted that right at, at on September seventh, I believe that that he had basically had failed in what he was supposed to do. So that was a failure on his part. Not that we're trying to put blame on Jeff or anything. It's just it's just the reality that he didn't have the authority to pass the cloak to Parminder, and he allowed that to occur. <clears throat> but again, this isn't really about the individuals. These are about the messages that are going on. Right. And, there, and there's a bunch of other symbols as we start to go through this. I mean, even where Barak is from, being Kadesh of Naphtali. So Kadesh is like the sanctuary. That's, that's the word that means the same one that's translated as holy. Um, and of Naphtali, so Naphtali is... Um, uh, referring to uh here what's the i can't remember what uh i just had it here i can't find it but anyway he comes out of this kadesh of naphtali so that's referring to to what? What's what's the significance of Naphtali again? Doesn't it mean something like um, my wrestlings or something like that? I think so. Okay, so it's my wrestlings, the wrestlings of the sanctuary. So this this to me. Um, and the Jacob looks at Naphtali, his son is coming out of his wrestlings, which we would think of as the wrestlings of, of, of Jacob and the angel of Christ. Okay. So even though, you know, this message has its, because Barak is timid, 
Um, he's the son of pleasantness or graciousness. So he's not a bold, this is not a bold message of attack. Uh, but this woman is going to defeat Sisera. And it comes out of the wrestlings of the sanctuary, of the holy place. And Genesis 49, 21 says, Naphtali is a hind let loose. He giveth goodly words. And then says, makes great promises. That's the alternative translation. Mm -hmm. All right. And she sent and called Barak, the son of Abinoam, out of Kadesh Naphtali, and said unto him, Hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, Go and draw toward Mount Tabor, and take with thee ten thousand men of the children of Naphtali, and of the children of Zebulun? Why is it important that he would take them of Naphtali and Zebulun? Why not of all Israel? Well, Israel's not united, for one. Two. Um, well, one is he doesn't trust Israel, it says. Elamite said that he didn't trust Israel, so he had this distrust of Israel. So he's taking those that he, he feels that he can trust. One being the son of Bilhah, one the other, of and one of Leah. Yeah. So we have the sixth son and the tenth son. What does a mean? Um, okay, that was pleasantness or graciousness. So we have a timid son of graciousness. Yeah, so it's a message that's not, it's not a bold message. Right. In the way that it's, it's being presented in order to counteract um, Cicero. So this is a message that is the antithesis of the message of July 18th. Um, I don't know about that. I, I, so when I look at the July 18th message from my perspective, so it was presented first in November of 2018, um, well, sort of the end of October, the beginning of November, that the message developed. And that message was not, it was accepted by Jeff, but it was fought against. And, and definitely it wasn't... Um, you know, there's all kinds of circumstances involved, but basically I put that message to bed, to rest for quite a long period of time. That is, I didn't fight for the message of July 18th. And it was on March 27th that uh, Odilio contacted me in 2019. First time I ever talked to him and told me that, you know, I couldn't abandon that message. So 
uh, but I still didn't do anything other than study it. It, was, it wasn't until uh, September 7th or after September 7th that Jeff then picked up that message again. And, and so then the message now was being listened to by the movement. But basically, the movement wasn't interested in the July 18th message. And if you look at that, that's, that's going to be almost, well, it's going to be about 10 months that, that the message is ignored by the movement. But does that time period of the message being ignored, does that make the message timid? Well, the message, the message itself, there's nothing in what was presented regarding July 18th that was meant to attack Parminder and his message. And, and I was actually using it as a support so everything that I was doing was a support for the November 9th message. Right. Right. So even though I didn't agree with November 9th based on how Parminder had come to it, I recognized that, or, Sess, or Tess had come to it, I had recognized that the November 9th was correct as far as the line was concerned because it had the witness of the 391.5, this whole structure, that actually gave us July 18th. But they wanted to hold on to November 9th without any of that support. That is, Tess completely rejected the 391.5, even though it's exactly the same number of days between uh, her birthday and that her birth and that of um, AOC, her her hero, who was um, uh, born on October 13th, um, 391 days. Uh, before Tess was born, October 13th, 1989, or yeah, 1989, and then Tess was born November 9th, 19, let me see, no, not 1989, uh, 2001, and Bess is born, uh, Tess is born in 2002 on November 9th, if I remember correctly. So anyway, the number of days difference is 391.5. So even though that exists, probably she doesn't know about that, but there was all these reasons that if she would have looked at it, she should have accepted the support for November 9th as being tied to her, because it is tied to her. Um, and, and that's my point. It's just that the message wasn't opposing Parminder when it should have been opposing Parminder, is, 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 I guess is my point. Because his reasons for time setting were false. Yeah, so it's not 1989. Um, it's 2000 and 2001. Or, or is it 1989? Yeah, it's 1989. That's, that's where it is. Anyway, yeah, where is this here? Yeah, AOC was born uh, October 13th, 1989. Yeah, 1989, at noon. That, yeah, that's what it is. It's 1989, because it has to do with the 30 years. So, yeah, and she was born at noon in New York. So so that puts the, the noon, October 13th, 2018, in line with uh, um, October 13th when... Uh, AOC was born, and then it it gives us the November 9th when Tess was born that follows in 2019. So Tess is going to be 29, not 30, on October 9th, 2019. Yeah, 1990. Yeah, so that's going to be 1990 that she's born on November 9th, 1990. One year after. Uh, the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, or the, the taking down of the Berlin Wall. Sorry it took me so long to sort through all those numbers and dates. <clears throat> but anyway, the, uh, I think the point here has to do with 
fact that the message of Parminder wasn't strongly opposed by the message of July 18th until Jeff took it up. Okay. Now, question in the chat Would that make test 16 at the time? Yeah, that was just if I was using 2001. I don't know why I was using 2001. Don't ask me why. Just my brain was confused. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it was 1990 that, that she was born. She was 29 on November 9th, 2019. Okay. Now we have a lot more that we're going to have to unpack here. And we are now over our time yeah. for today. Yeah, and, and, and so just to, to sort of, so, I mean, I may be forcing my interpretation upon this at this point, but it's just how I saw the story of, of Judges chapter four, but maybe, maybe I'm applying it wrong. Well, I think that we each have some things we're going to have to look at in this particular chapter. Yeah. Because we're going to return to this again tomorrow. Any other thoughts or comments at this time? Okay. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for these examples that we can relate to our time. Help us now to understand these things more clearly. Direct us so that we may see the light that has been showing behind us. Help us to understand that which you would have us to understand for today. Direct us now, bless us as we go forward. May others see your character in all that we do, may your will be done on earth as it is truly being done in heaven. For this, we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.